The gospel this morning for Palm Sunday is from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Here ends the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. I bring grace, peace, mercy to you from God our Father, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was a senior in high school, I was in an accident driving, hi Ian, when I was driving to go see my girlfriend's, high school girlfriend's basketball game. My best friend at the time, he was driving, and uh, along with us, he had his girlfriend's three little sisters in the car too. I was in the passenger seat. It was a snowy Michigan Saturday, and we were on a countryside two-lane highway, If you're from the Midwest, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right, Distats? My friend Eric, who was driving, uh, we were behind this truck that was going, it was inching along in the snowy day, and and, uh, Eric wanted to pass it. And so, you know, when you get behind a car and and you want to pass it and you're in a two-lane, you kind of, you you, uh, put your foot on the, the gas and you speed up and then you get in the lane and move over and pass them. And so Eric started to accelerate right behind the truck and as he started to accelerate, all of a sudden the truck hit its brakes and boom, red lights flash. Eric reacted, jerked the wheel and all of a sudden we hit a patch of ice and start spinning around and around. And I remember as we spun and spun, we turned simply into a slow skid. And as we skidded into this farm field right next to the road, I saw me in the passenger seat directly headed toward a telephone pole. And just in those few seconds, I was thinking, this is it. But in the last few seconds just the last few seconds, feet from the telephone pole, we hit this embankment of snow and dirt, and the car just kind of went boom, and went up, and went down. To me, to this day, I still think that embankment, it saved my life, it saved Eric's life, and the girl's life. And in the end, we were all okay, amazingly. Like, not a single physical scratch on us, just emotional scars, and freaked out a little bit. But the thing is, is that ever since that accident, ever since I was a senior in high school, whenever there's that question, well, who's going to drive? I jump at it right away. I want to drive. If ever there's an opportunity, I'd like to drive. And the reason being is because there's something about being behind the wheel, where you have this sense of power and control. For me, being behind the wheel, I always think, I have that flashback, and I think, if I'm driving, I can avoid the patches of ice. In our text today, the Pharisees, the ruling elites, the ruling class during Jesus' time, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the high priest, they saw Jesus as a patch of ice. They saw him as someone that was going to cause them to lose their control. They saw him as as someone, something that was going to threaten their livelihood, the way that they lived, the life that they wanted to have and hold on to. They saw crowds waving palms, shouting, Hosanna. We We just sang that, which means save us. 
Imagine being like a ruler of your society and all of a sudden the common folk are saying, save us, save us, save us from who? From you. They heard these crowds echo the Psalms. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, the one who comes, that language is loaded with meaning during this time. It's, it's filled with connotations. If we look at the book of Malachi, it's talking about the one who will come and deliver. A deliverer, a prophet, a king. One who will restore Israel. And then they hear the most audacious claim. Blessings on the king of Israel. This was a patch of ice for them. Jesus was about to mess everything up that they had. In order to see that, I think it requires just a little bit of background. See, because the, the rulers at this time is really Rome, the empire. But Rome cut a deal with all of their little pocket territories that they had. So long as you paid your taxes and you squashed revolt, you can have, have your say. You can have your culture, you can have your worship, you can have your religion, just pay your taxes, squash revolt, and at the end of the day, know who's boss, basically. And so they made deals with sort of puppet governors and, and different ruling classes in order to keep the peace. Pay your taxes, squash revolt. And the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priest, the Sanhedrin, they cut this deal, they liked this deal because they were able to get rich off of it. They were able to have power. They were able to have prominence in their society. They were able to dictate the religious customs and the culture. And they didn't want this to get messed up. And the one thing that could mess this up would be revolution. Because this region had seen revolt before. A little more, just a little more than 150 years before Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. There were great crowds that gathered in the streets of Jerusalem saying the same things that we heard today and waving palm branches in celebration of a new king. A different one, not Jesus, but a new king 150 years before Jesus. His name was Judas Maccabeus. He and his revolutionary army, they had defeated the Seleucid Empire, sort of a precursor to Rome. They defeated, they retaken the city of Jerusalem, they had recaptured the temple, and they had, had, had uh, given prominence back to the Jewish people. And they called Judas the king of Israel. And this scares every empire from then on out. And so imagine being those Pharisees, those Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, seeing palms waving, king of Israel, the one thing that can mess this up is revolution. Jesus was a patch of ice to them. He was about to mess everything up. If we're honest with ourselves, because sometimes we always, you know, the Pharisees are always the bad guys. But in reality, they're more like us than uh, they're not. Because deep within you and I, myself included, is this driving impulse to control your life. To have the power over your livelihood. And not just yours, but the people around you. We do everything we can to avoid those patches of ice. We want the control. And COVID, that's really tested us, hasn't it? It's been a year of a lot of people telling us what to do and how to live. But, you know... Everyone wants to talk about COVID. Let's just put it away for a second. Me too, Matthew. Because I think a good example of this that we see in our, our world that we live in, our society, um, is, is generations. If you think about generations. If we look back and, and reflect over the history of just the past hundred years, there's, we see this common refrain of older and younger generations constantly clashing about what uh, what are the acceptable norms of today? Think just, for instance, music, right? Music. Uh, you know, you go back to the 50s and 60s, and you get this thing, rock and roll, coming up. Those hedons, you know, jamming out. You guys over there. 
How dare you? Silent generation, the boomers, the Gen X, battling over this newfangled music. And hey, it's no different today. It's hip-hop, it's trap music, it's electronic music, it's that sappy, hipster, folk music. But it's not just music, right? It's fashion. It's language. It's politics. It's anything that really defines our cultural norms. There is this, just this common refrain of one generation saying, be like us, and the other saying, no change. And all of it, all of it, to me, just boils down to this incessant need that we have as human beings to try and control our lives, to try and have this power, this dominating power. But that's the macro, right? That's that's people being people. You see it in politics, too. I mean, that's what politics is. But then it it plays out in the microcosms of our, our our, our lives as well, in our relationships. You know, I grew up in a household with someone who struggled with an addiction. And there's a lot of us sitting here. If you're, if you're one of those people, don't think you're alone, because they're sitting all in this pew right here, right now. Whether you're the one that struggles or you're the one that has the loved one, uh, it's, it's everywhere. And there's, there's one thing that I think you, you, you start to learn. I don't know if you ever fully do learn in that household. And it's, it's that you can't change someone. As much as you want to, as much as what they do and what they're addicted to and the repeated behaviors and habits that they have, as much as you want to see them change and stop because you see it hurting them, it's hurting you, it's hurting your family, you can't change them. But you want to. You think about it. It drives you crazy. You say things like, if only... We have this need to have power and control in our lives. Not just in the macro, but in the microcosms. And and it could be any other relational circumstance that you're going through right now. Where are you trying to control the situation? Control the outcome? Control the person? And we do everything we can to avoid those ice patches of everyday life. And they're everywhere. And we find ourselves, if you're like me, you find yourself constantly being spun out, wondering where's up, where's down. But the thing is, when we hear the text today, like really hear it, like put yourself in the streets with the crowds and hear what they're saying. We hear the essential truth. The truth. Jesus is king. Jesus is sovereign. God is sovereign. Christ is the one who's in control. This is a core doctrine to what we believe as Christians. That God has providence. God who is creator, redeemer, sustainer. He is the one and sole author and and owner of all authority and power. He has providence. God is king of kings. He's lord of lords. He's president of presidents. Jesus is king, as Kanye West brilliantly named his gospel album. That's the truth. That's the truth of this passage. So the question really becomes then, what does that kingship look like? Or how one of my professors at Fuller Seminary in her commentary on John, how she puts it, um, is is what is at stake is not whether Jesus is king, but how he will assume and exercise his sovereignty. And so over the course of this next week, Like Pastor Garrett said in the beginning, we're just beginning our service. This is what Holy Week is. Seeing how Christ will assume and exercise his sovereignty. And the thing is, it's in the most audacious, crazy way. There's sort of three things in our text today that I think kind of pop out at what this looks like and what we're going to see moving forward. 
One is it's palms are waving. <laughs> palms are waving. What, what is the purpose of Christ's kingship? How is he going to be king in our lives? Well, it's, he starts with what every king does. He rules. He rules over you. And as Americans, that's scary. We don't like that. <laughs> We're all about individualism. We're taught that at a very early age, right? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Go out there, make your name for yourself, and, and earn what you uh, uh, want in life. We don't want dictators. We don't want people oppressing us. The thing is, is the idea of ruling, is, it doesn't just show up in the Gospels. It doesn't just show up in our text today. It starts on page one of your Bibles. It starts in the very beginning, this concept of rule, what it means to biblically rule, and how God rules in our lives. You might be asking, like, we're in John, so why Genesis? Uh, well, one of the things John is doing is he's writing a new Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. What John wants us to see is that Christ brings about a new creation, a new life. And in Genesis 1, uh, what we have there is the picture of God creating everything, creating what we know today, but he's doing so through the imagery of a temple. He's ordering this chaos and putting it into this beautiful temple. And we get stuck on the sixth day because that's when we were made, because we like thinking about ourselves. But the climax and the pinnacle of the creation account is the seventh day when God rests in his temple. And it's not he took a nap. <laughs> that idea of him resting, he's resting on his throne as a king would sit after his coronation ceremony. He's come to his kingship. It has been complete. He is now set to rule. His law is the law of the land. But the thing is, is he shares, he shares his ruling with the people, with humanity in day six. It's one of the commands that are given to human beings. Be fruitful and multiply and rule, have dominion. But they're to rule and have dominion in a way that we don't understand, I think. It's not as a dictator. It doesn't look like an oppressor. It looks like what we see on the next page of our Bibles as gardeners, Adam and Eve. And gardener, gardeners don't oppress. Their yoke, is not he, their, their yoke is not heavy, it's light. They care and they cultivate the environments around them. They have love for, their, for the creation. So he came to rule, but in a way that, that we don't see in our daily lives. One that has care and nurtures and cultivates not through force or cohesion. Number two, so he came to rule. Number two, it, all of this account of Palm Sunday and John, it's in, in, in the synoptics, it's wrapped up in the Passover. He's going to Jerusalem for the Passover. John is writing a new Genesis. He's also writing a new Exodus. The Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. This theme throughout all of John. What Jesus is coming to Jerusalem for is to be that lamb. To sacrifice, to save, to redeem. Like God redeemed his people out of Israel. He bought them back despite their failings, despite their faithlessness. And so Christ has come to Jerusalem as king to do this as well, to redeem his people, to buy them back despite their failings and their misgivings, and their sin. He came to rule, he came to redeem. The third, the third piece of this story is that is, Passover is what we're moving toward, but what we just came from was Lazarus' resurrection. This whole text today is wrapped up in the story of Lazarus. In fact, it's continuing the story of Re Lazarus' resurrection. And it, it, the, the resurrection of Lazarus becomes this tipping point for those Pharisees, those Sadducees. This is what really scares them in the Gospel of John. Oh, he did what? What Christ as king has come to do is bring us life. 
as he brought life to Lazarus. He rides in on this donkey coming to Jerusalem to redeem, to buy back, but not just to buy back for you to have the same life that you've been living all along, but to give you a brand new one. One that's in him, where this incessant need to rule and control is rested in his power, his authority, and it's done through the trust and faith that he is providing for you. He came to rule, he came to redeem, he came to renew and give us life. And all of this, at the end, the Pharisees, they're freaking out, right? The patch of ice. And they say, look, you've gained nothing. The whole world is following him. That's funny. It's really funny because like, at this point, the whole world's not following him. His following is gaining. But what they're about to do, what we're going to see happen on Thursday and Friday, is going to cause the entire world to follow him. See, Christ was not their patch of ice. He was the embankment that at just the last moment saved them from their own failings their own misgivings, their own inability to actually have power and control in their life. He came to renew, not to destroy. To make what is and was to be real and true. To make what we see in Genesis to be real and true. And it's the same in our lives. He's doing this for you right now. Jesus is in control of your life. You aren't. He's leading and ruling over you. He's redeeming you. He's renewing you. He's drawing you to himself as he drew those crowds that first Palm Sunday. That's why you're here. Whatever is going on in your life, whatever patches of ice you find yourself spinning in and out of, Christ is in control. You don't like your grandson's music. You don't like your grandma's music. Jesus is in control. He is king. He has power. He is the embankment overseeing the cultural shifts and divides that are in shaping our hearts and desires toward him. And as Christians, our job is to trust this. To trust him and to cling to this more than clinging to our own desires and our own wills, the things that we want in our lives. So when he rides into your life next, don't treat him like a patch of ice. He's not here to spin you out of control. It might feel that way. Jesus does upend your life. Like, he challenges you. But he's always calling you up. He's not calling you out. He's calling you up to who you've been created to be. He's not calling you out to shame you or to throw you out or to do you in. He's calling you up. Christ is king. He's your embankment. And as we move forward this week, and we see and we hear the gospel texts, we see how Christ is exalted as king as he sits on his throne, the cross. We experience this different type of king. My prayer for you is that you trust in his different way of ruling your life. That you listen to his voice over your own because he's not here to mess up your life. He's here to renew your life. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I pray and thank you for uh, this day that you've given us. Pray that you set our hearts anew and right and directed toward you, that we seek your will above our own, and that we seek your kingship and your power and your glory over our desires and our needs. Lord, we give all things to you and we trust in you in your most holy and precious name. Amen.